someone like you is my brother's wife? You should release him. I had thought I was getting along with my sister-in-law, but she showed her true colors when we were alone. I was taken aback by her drastic change in attitude, but I realized that this must be her true nature. My name is Jennifer, I'm 30 years old. It's been four years since I married my husband, Michael, who's two years older than me. We met through work and initially lived just the two of us. However, after my father-in-law passed away two years ago, we started living with my mother-in-law. I suggested this because I thought it would be tough for her to live alone, and we lived too far away to come quickly if something happened. Besides, my mother-in-law had quite a fortune, both from her own assets and the inheritance from my father-in-law. So there was also the worry that she might fall victim to a scam. Michael was concerned as well, and since the commute from his mother's place was no issue, we decided to move in with her. Our relationship with my mother-in-law was already good, so I wasn't worried, but living together turned out to be even more comfortable than I'd expected. We had similar hobbies and got along even better than before since we both were indoor types who liked the same things. So we enjoyed our time at home together. Perhaps because of this, my mother-in-law seemed happier and laughed more often, which Michael was also pleased to see. After moving in, I began to do housework and also started a part-time job at a local children's facility. It was a part-time gig about three times a week, but being around those energetic kids seemed to uplift my spirits too. Since moving in, my days have been more fulfilling than ever. I think living together was the right choice, but there was one problem. My sister-in-law, Emily, who's the same age as me. Emily was already married and out of the house when I married Michael, so I only saw her about once a year. When it was just the two of us, she often made snide remarks. Before, when there were others around, her attitude towards me was polite, so until then, I had thought we could be friends. The first time Emily directed her malice at me, I was dumbfounded. Since then, I found her unpleasant, but since we rarely met, I didn't think much of it. However, now that we were living in the same house, we saw each other often. Emily didn't live nearby, but she had been coming over almost every weekend even before. She'd have lunch and sometimes stay for dinner. Although she had her own family, I couldn't help feeling it was presumptuous, but my mother-in-law, being wealthy, didn't seem to mind. And while Emily was mean to me, she didn't act that way in front of my mother-in-law or Michael. For them, she was still their adorable daughter and sister. Especially Michael and Emily, who shared a love for outdoor activities since childhood and got along very well due to similar interests. I couldn't bring myself to tell my mother-in-law and Michael that Emily disliked me. Hey, I'm back. Oh, Jennifer. Could you take care of my children for me? So, I ended up looking after her children while she spent time with Michael and my mother-in-law. Emily seemed to love her family, and perhaps because of my good relationship with them, she didn't take kindly to me, always finding chores for me to do. She never forgot to sneak in a mean comment in a whisper. I've got two children and parenting is tough. You should be grateful I'm giving you this chance to practice. Emily would come over almost without fail on weekends, knowing that at her parents' home. She could take a break from childcare and hand it off to me, acting as if she was doing me a favor. Her children were a bit chubby and rambunctious, and while I didn't mind looking after them, I was fed up with the constant snide remarks. I wanted to snap back, but I held my tongue in front of her children. Since Emily was always smiling on the surface, any retort from me could make me seem like the villain instead of her. So, I kept my replies safe and stayed quiet. To outsiders, Emily and I appeared to be chatting happily, leading my mother-in-law and Michael to comment on how well we got along, to which I could only respond with a vague smile. In this close-knit family, I couldn't just say, Emily has a bad personality. And because I never fought back, Emily became more emboldened to bully me. It's good that you can practice parenting now. Make sure you do it properly, okay? And you're not just leaving all the housework to mom, right? Since you're living together, you should do it perfectly. Especially after my mother-in-law, who seemed so happy to do crafts together, it felt all the more like she was snapping at me out of irritation. Sucking up to mom, you're such an old-fashioned woman. It seems my sister-in-law believes that I have a better relationship with her mother than she does. Maybe it's because our hobbies, as well as our personalities, are similar, but I feel calm when I'm with my mother-in-law. 
She feels the same way, and my sister-in-law doesn't like that we get along so well, so she complains to me. Every time we meet, she always has a snide comment for me, but I just let it slide without provoking her. It felt like a child's tantrum even though we're adults, so I never got down about her sarcastic remarks. Sometimes I do housework better and faster than she does, so her complaints often sound like sour grapes. Lately, however, the comments have started to focus on the fact that I don't have kids yet. From this point on, I couldn't brush off her snide remarks as easily. It's been about three years since you got married, right? Why no baby yet? My sister-in-law, with two children, would smirk as if her position was superior to mine because I had none. Children are gifts, they're not about timing. I was concerned about not having children, so I tried to act unaffected in front of her, but it was disheartening inside. I work part-time at a children's facility and am involved with kids a lot, but I still wish I could have my own soon. When she brings up children, I can't come back with a clever retort like I used to. She just smirks triumphantly at me. Now into the fourth year of marriage. I've been continuously bothered by my sister-in-law's comments about not being able to have a baby, so I decided to visit a doctor. Her words had made me anxious about possibly being infertile. I've been consulting with my husband more, and he's been reassuring me that there's no need to worry. I'd be happy if we had kids, but the most important thing is that you're with me. There's no need to rush. He also said, let's work on having children together. That made me feel like I had met a good man. My husband's support meant that, although I felt anxious because of my sister-in-law's mean comments, I didn't take it too seriously. We went to the hospital for tests, thinking it would be nice to get checked out, just to be sure. But we were in for a shock with the unexpected results. What? No way. I had to ask several times to make sure it wasn't a dream, but I almost burst into tears when I realized it was real. I was actually pregnant, about two months along. My menstrual cycle often fluctuates, so I just thought it was late this time, but I never imagined I was pregnant. I had thought that I might be infertile, so this news was incredibly welcome. I had no typical pregnancy symptoms, so the unexpected result surprised me, but my husband and I were delighted. I was more smiley than before we went to the doctor, and when we got home, I shared the news with my mother-in-law, and the three of us celebrated together. I stroked my still flat belly, conveying my happiness to the baby that was going to be born. With this news, all my previous anxieties vanished, and I eagerly awaited the birth of my baby. As for my sister-in-law's reaction, she continued her sarcasm when it was just the two of us. Maybe it was because the content of her sarcasm decreased, or perhaps she didn't like seeing me so consistently happy about my pregnancy, but she seemed out of sorts. To me, excited about the baby, her sarcasm felt like a gentle breeze, not bothering me at all. However, at the next checkup, I was devastated to learn I had miscarried. What? Why? I asked the doctor, nearly crying. I had already been thinking a lot about parenting methods and things I wanted to do with the child, looking forward to the birth, so the miscarriage was unthinkable. I had researched pregnant life and didn't recall doing anything that could have caused a miscarriage. The shock of the miscarriage and the self-blame were almost crushing. The doctor explained that early miscarriages are relatively common. Sometimes due to chromosomal abnormalities, they can happen even when there is nothing wrong on the mother's side. I was told not to dwell on it too much, but I couldn't help it. I had been longing for a baby, so when I finally got pregnant, I was over the moon. But after suffering a miscarriage, the joy I had been feeling until then turned into a profound shock that left me deeply saddened. My husband and mother-in-law were worried and tried to cheer me up, but because I had been so looking forward to having a baby, I found it hard to bounce back and couldn't manage to return to my normal routine. Moreover, my sister-in-law's sarcasm seemed to intensify after she heard about the miscarriage, deepening my depression. What on earth did you do to miscarry? You're not cut out to be a mother. And once you have one miscarriage, aren't you likely to never have children? What's the point of being married if you can't have a baby? She would say these cruel words with such glee, it was clear she enjoyed hurting me. Because of this, I began to despair that I might never be able to have a baby. Normally, I would have snapped back at her, but I was so down that I just took it all by myself. 
I tried to act normal at my part-time job, but even the kids there could tell I wasn't my usual self and expressed their concern, which only made me feel worse. I knew I couldn't go on like this, yet I couldn't shake off the feeling of being listless and devoid of energy. This distraction may have led to me falling down the stairs on my way to work, resulting in an injury that required hospitalization. I tumbled and bruised myself all over, fracturing my right arm and leg severely. Thankfully, a passerby called an ambulance, and I ended up being admitted to the hospital for a month. I felt terrible for worrying my husband and mother-in-law, who came to the hospital looking so concerned. We were afraid you had gotten reckless because you were so down. It's a relief you're fine. You've been losing so much weight, and now an injury on top of that. We were so worried. Seeing their tearful, worried faces, I realized just how much concern I had caused them. I had lost my appetite and weight from all the distress, which only added to their worries. It finally hit me just how neglected my body had become, not just from the injury, but from lack of care in general. I had forgotten to look after my skin and hair because I had no appetite. However, their words because of my injury made me decide to change my mindset. I'm sorry for worrying you. But I won't be down anymore. I'll recover from this injury quickly. I declared with newfound energy in my voice. Saying it out loud seemed to boost my spirits even more. Though the injury was unfortunate, it helped me to finally start moving past the trauma of the miscarriage. I was fortunate to have a private room in the hospital, which allowed me to rest peacefully. Thanks to my mother-in-law who generously covered the extra cost for it. The facilities were quite comfortable, which made my stay much easier. The beautiful flowers brought by my husband and mother-in-law also brightened up the stark white room. Since my dominant arm was out of commission, they often visited to keep me company and brought things I could enjoy without using my right arm. I started practicing writing with my left hand, and although it was inconvenient due to my injury, I was able to spend my time comfortably. My co-workers from the part-time job also visited, and the children sent a card with their clumsy handwriting saying, get well soon, which warmed my heart. The thought of showing everyone a healthier me after getting out of the hospital filled me with vigor. However, the one thing that still caused me stress was when my sister-in-law visited alone. She would never say anything mean when others were around, but alone in the room with me, she could be quite nasty. With no way to escape in the private room, I felt trapped. It didn't feel right to call for a nurse for such matters. So I just had to endure her snide remarks until someone else came or she decided to leave. She would often come just to deliver her unpleasant comments, which made me wonder if she had too much free time on her hands. But once, when I pretended to be asleep, she left soon after arriving, so I began to fake sleep whenever she was expected to visit. Which thankfully reduced the number of her nasty comments. Finally, the day came when I was set to be discharged. You're gonna be out soon. We were thinking of throwing a little celebration party for you at home once you're out, what do you think? My husband and mother-in-law suggested excitedly. Wow, I can't wait! I replied, genuinely touched by their thoughtfulness. Emily will be happy to hear about your recovery. She's been worried about you. My mother-in-law said that. Which meant even Emily would be there. It made me feel a bit disappointed. But my in-laws were oblivious to Emily's treatment towards me, so I couldn't really express my concern. I wasn't thrilled about my sister-in-law coming over, but I figured as long as I wasn't alone with her and stuck close to my husband and mother-in-law during the party, it would be okay. When I got home from the hospital, the house was already festively decorated with bright, colorful flowers, which lifted my spirits for the first time in a while. The table was full of delicious-looking food, some cooked by my mother-in-law and some bought from stores. Right when everything was almost ready, my sister-in-law arrived with a big bag in tow. Sorry I'm late. Congratulations on your discharge, Jennifer. She said with a perfect smile, and I thanked her with a smile of my own. Despite being taken aback by her previous snide remarks in my hospital room. I was amazed at how amazing her acting skills were. We all sat down, glasses filled with drinks in hand. Here's to Jennifer's discharge. Michael, toasted, and we started our meal. I didn't drink alcohol because of my injury, but the other three were pouring it liberally. Especially my sister-in-law, 
who brought her own and drank generously without bothering me, which made me feel relieved that the meal would go smoothly. Even with my right hand out of commission, I managed to eat by myself thanks to the easy-to-use utensils my mother-in-law had prepared for me. And my left-handed skills had improved. As the food started to dwindle and we were about to wrap up, my sister-in-law handed me a gift. Oh, I almost forgot. This is for your discharge. Open it when you're alone. She gave it to me with a flushed, drunken face. Thanks so much. She had a lot of baggage considering it was just alcohol, but I never expected that my sister-in-law would have the idea of celebrating my discharge from the hospital. I was surprised that she'd thought to give me a discharge gift, as it had not crossed my mind she would do something like that. Wow, a discharge gift? That's sweet. Thanks. Michael said, sounding impressed and a bit tipsy. My mother-in-law smiled happily at what seemed like a caring and close-knit family scene. After that, my sister-in-law excused herself to use the bathroom before heading out. My mother-in-law and Michael told me to take it easy and sit while they started cleaning up. With my injury, I took their advice and sat on the couch, looking at the present she'd given me. It wasn't very heavy, wrapped in flower-patterned paper with an orange ribbon which was a cheery combination. However, I had my doubts. It was unusual for my sister-in-law to give me a gift. And her whispering, open it when you're alone, sounded downright suspicious. With her out of the room, I decided to open the present right away. Inside, I found items that were peculiar to receive as a present for my situation, which made me pause in confusion. What is this? I exclaimed, dropping the gift in shock. What's wrong? What happened? Michael and my mother-in-law rushed over, confused as they looked at the dropped present I was pointing at. This. I didn't think I could explain it well, so I pointed to the present I had dropped. Then, they looked at it curiously and seemed just as confused as I was. Inside were baby items and craft supplies. Sure, I hadn't given up on the idea of having children one day, and I did enjoy crafting. But it had only been six months since my miscarriage, and with my injury, I couldn't even do crafts if I wanted to. The contents were so mismatched for a discharge gift. Giving baby items to someone still recovering from a miscarriage and an injury felt like a deliberate insult. Had I not been on the path to recovery, seeing those baby items could have devastated me. They were also confused because it was not intended to be given as a congratulations on my discharge from hospital, considering my situation. The perplexity turned to anger when we found a message card inside. It should have contained uplifting words, but instead, it was filled with malice from my sister-in-law, a useless wife should just leave. Try having kids or doing crafts if you can. Huh? What? At first, they were both stunned into silence, perhaps because they had thought my sister-in-law and I got along well. But it wasn't long before they started to get angry about what Emily had done. Just then, Emily came back from the bathroom and entered the room, which led my husband Michael to confront her. Hey! What were you thinking giving this to Jennifer? He demanded, his voice thundering in sudden anger. Emily looked confused at first, but upon seeing the gift wrap in Michael's hand, she seemed to realize what had happened. Huh? You opened it? I told you to look at it when you were alone. However, whether it was because she was drunk or just didn't care, Emily didn't seem the least bit sorry and instead complained to me. Michael's anger only grew at her attitude. How could you give such a thing? What were you thinking? But Emily, undeterred and as if it was the most natural thing to say, retorted. Well, it's pointless to have a wife who can't have kids, who's hurt and lost her worth, who can't do anything right. You should just divorce her and marry someone better. Despite Michael's intense shouting, Emily remained calm and continued to insult me. She even went as far as to tell Michael, I can introduce you to someone nice. Delighted with her own suggestion, Emily started laughing out loud. Michael, red-faced and fists clenched, seemed too furious to speak. In the midst of this, we heard my mother-in-law Jennifer's sigh. Then my mother-in-law, who appeared to have calmed down, said softly, almost to herself, I'm going to cut ties with you. At the word cut ties, Emily looked at me triumphantly. Mistaking my mother-in-law's intent as agreement with her. That's right. We don't need someone like her in the family. 
she said and started laughing again, but she froze at my mother-in-law's next words. I'm cutting ties with you, Emily. What? Emily's confusion was evident, and suddenly she seemed to sober up and began to panic. Why? We're family, right? If anyone should be cut ties, it should be Jennifer, not me. Emily protested, unable to accept the idea of being disowned, but my mother-in-law continued firmly. Someone who cannot think of others' feelings, who hurls such malice, is not our family. Don't bother me again because I won't be buying any of your husband's products anymore. That'll hurt us. Your buying affects my husband's sales. Emily's husband was in sales, and thanks to Jennifer often obliging Emily's requests, she regularly purchased the products he sold, which were not commonly bought due to their high price. Emily cried and pleaded as stopping these purchases would impact her husband's performance. Stop it! We're family! Think of my children, they'll suffer too! You're no sister or family of mine anymore! Don't show up in front of me again! In his rage at Emily's insults towards me, Michael dragged her out, along with her belongings, and locked her out of the house. They ignored her knocks and pleas to be let back in. She lingered outside for a while but eventually left, presumably going back to her own place. Later on, Jennifer informed Emily's husband that she would no longer purchase his products, explaining the recent events. This led to Emily being reprimanded severely, she had been a homemaker receiving an allowance from her husband, which now seemed to have been cut off. The lack of spending money and the stern treatment from her husband seemed to have left her distressed, causing her to act out making her increasingly unwelcome among her own parents and family. It's obvious that being mean or harassing others will get you disliked. I no longer meet with Emily, but I hope she takes this opportunity to reflect and change. Afterwards, Emily persistently tried to contact Michael and Jennifer, but they soon blocked her calls. They even went as far as to cut ties with her. Michael and my mother-in-law also apologized to me for not realizing sooner how Emily had been treating me. In turn, I apologized for not confiding in them about it. Once Emily was out of the picture, I stopped being harassed and, free from stress, my injuries healed and I was able to return to work cheerfully. The children were delighted with my return and that made me happy. Two years later, I finally had my baby I had longed for and I was moved to tears. While I'll never forget my first baby, I'm determined to cherish and care for my baby.